listening to Transformation in Trials. Welcome to Transformation in Trials. This is a podcast exploring all things transformational in clinical trials. Nothing is off limits on the show, and we will have guests from the whole spectrum of the clinical trials community. And we're your hosts, Ivana and Sam. Um, Before we start this week's episode... Uh, we have a small disclaimer that everybody that appears on the Transformation in Trials podcast does so in their own capacity and represents their own views and opinions and not those of any other organisation that they may be affiliated with or who they may work for. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Transformation in Trials podcast. Uh, Today, Ivana and I are really excited to be joined uh, by Sophia Zilba. Sophia is an expert when it comes to all things statistical programming in the pharmaceutical industry, and she's also a board and patient registry director for an organization called Cure Mito, and she's going to get into a lot more about what she does and what Cure Mito does during the course of this podcast. But first of all, great to have you on the show, Sophia. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Perfect. Now, the topic of today is one that I know uh, you're very passionate about. Um, And what we're going to talk about is bridging the gap between patient registries and research in rare disease. So to get us started, Sophia, and to set the stage, Perhaps you could tell our listeners a little more about the role of patient advocacy groups uh, when it comes to collecting patient data for registry. Thank you so much, Sam. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, such a great topic. And um, I'll just um, introduce a little bit how I got into this. So I've always worked in the pharmaceutical industry and statistical programming. I've worked on uh, clinical trials data. Um, very sadly, five years ago, I had a personal tragedy. I lost my, my newborn daughter to a rare disease. And so um, after that, I wanted to leverage my skills and be able to help uh, with her disease. And um, she had Lee syndrome, which is a rare disease, which is a type of mitochondrial disease. And so um, I know that in the rare disease, there is not enough resources, there's not enough funding, and data is very important. So I've offered my skills to mitochondrial disease community, and this is how I basically got into this. And um, I didn't know at that point actually much about how patient registries are run, uh, and I didn't know that patients basically run them themselves through the patient advocacy organizations. And so um, that's what I learned is that rare disease organizations, patient advocacy organizations, they basically create their own registries. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be associated with necessarily any sponsor or if they, they create these registries for their disease and they collect data for their disease with the hope that one day it's gonna help research or it's gonna help uh, clinical trials for their disease. So this is how uh, I became involved and, and learned all about it. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, these registries and what kind of data uh, do they usually collect? Yeah, so that's a great question. So these registries, uh, I guess the biggest challenge with them is that there isn't really a clear guidance on how they should be run. Um, And right now there is an FDA guidance for registries, but that applies to registries that are associated with a specific product and it's more for industry sponsors. Uh, there is no real guidance for the patient groups about registries. And uh, in addition to that, patient groups don't necessarily have sort of a data analyst or someone who can help them and guide them in regards to these registries. So I think um, it, it really depends on an organization that's collecting the data, but a lot of times what happens is that there is no clarity. So there's no clarity about why the data is collected or how it's going to be used or the quality of that data. Uh, Usually patient groups work with registry vendors, but what happens many times is that they don't necessarily see the data, like they they don't always have a way to export this data and, and look at this data. And in some cases, they're able to see some summaries, like some some graphics, some graphs or some tables representing the data, but 
as we all know, when we work with the data before creating these little tables and graphs, we really have to look at the data very carefully to make sure. And I'm not talking here about any, you know, regulatory grade data, but just the basic sort of, I saw the data where the patient is an adult, but their age is three years old, for example. So things like that, that are very, very basic, like logic checks, checking for missing data, checking for data quality on a very basic level. Unfortunately, they're not always there. And so, uh, even though this data is, it's so important to collect this data on rare disease, but we also have to kind of be mindful of how to collect it to make sure that it's useful. And um, one thing that I have been recommending to a lot of the rare disease groups is just like they all have medical advisors and scientific advisors to also have data advisors, somebody who can really work with them and whatever registry vendor they're using to help them, to first of all, to, to help them select that registry vendor and, um, and to help them, to, to guide them so that the data they're collecting can actually be used. Fascinating. What are some of the impacts of this um, data, what I would call it maybe data chaos, the situation <laughs> that's um, ensuing at the registries? Uh, what are some of the impacts and um, possible challenges associated with uh, having data um, in this disorder or collecting data in this disorganized fashion? Well, I mean, the impact is that, that uh, I mean, the biggest thing is like, for me, you know, I'm a data analyst, but I've also been on the patient side, you know, and so... I always think about the patients first and I'm thinking about these patients who enroll for these registries and who have this hope that this is going to this is going to advance research, advance treatments. So one thing that I always kind of try to put in the center of this whole thing is just to say, look, um, we have to be transparent with the patients. Patients are, are, are trusting us with this data. They are enrolling, they're putting their hope into this. So we like they have to account be accountable to them, first of all. And so uh, I mean, like to your question, what's the impact? The impact is that we we may not we may get data that isn't going to be used for anything. It's just a loss of a, you know, loss of time and loss of hope, which yeah. is the biggest thing. If I put myself into the shoes of somebody who might uh, give somebody data for whatever reason, there's an assumption there that that data is going to be put to use of some description. It's almost assumed, isn't it? So I would imagine there's lots of patients out there who are potentially giving this data thinking that it is going to be uh, readily available for to be put to good use, but it doesn't sound like that's necessarily the case. Uh, right. So um, again, because there is no guidance and because everyone's kind of doing their own thing, it's very hard to figure out what's uh, what's going on. So, some of so I've done a number of presentations and talks about this, and uh, at, right now a lot of rare disease groups are reaching out to me and asking questions. And so I'm really trying and working hard to kind of change this this whole scene. Um, I mean, some things that I advise, so like I said, having a data advisor, I, I think it's so important. I, I think that every rare disease group who is thinking about the registry should have a data advisor who understands data and who can uh, work with any registry vendor to request the data diction. I always say, you know, data dictionary comes first, uh, make sure that you can export the data. And these are the first steps. Um, you know, if the, if the data dictionary is not available, if data cannot be exported, it's very, very hard to tell what's really in that data if it's sitting within some platform where there's no access to it. So I'm really, really trying to change that. Some other things I recommend, uh, you know, data analysis. Uh, if you are like, sometimes I ask, like, when, when are you starting data analysis? Or in some groups, they're just waiting until a researcher will request their data, which may happen, you know, in years from now, or it, it doesn't, it's not that straightforward. The, the researchers to have a grant and they have to have a specific project. They can just pick up their data and work on it. it so, um, and if you look at data, you know, five years after it's been collected, uh, unfortunately, uh, whatever data issues are in it, it, it may be too late to, to you know, change them or 
uh, the data may or may not be usable. So I always say, you know, as soon as one patient is enrolled, that, that's a good time to start data analysis. So you can catch anything, any uh, any potential data issues, anything that needs to be updated in the survey, it can be found immediately. Well, Sophia, I know that it, uh, statistical programmers in the life science space are a, a very rare bunch. There are not a lot of you uh, out there. So how how could some of these uh, advocacy groups find someone to collaborate with that could help them uh, with their data? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, they found me because I am the one that uh, came to them. I think that that's something we have to talk within our industry with the others. How do we make ourselves more available so that patient groups know that who they need to reach out to? Because when they work on a disease, they know that they need to reach out to doctors and researchers. They know that. So they will reach out to doctors and researchers for their disease. But they are not going to reach out to a statistical programmer or look for one because they don't even know it exists. And I actually found that it's interesting, but I think when we work in the industry, we kind of just know we, we our team consists of different functions, but we know that clinician is responsible for, you know, for, for part of the project related to, you know, the medical, medical uh, things or, but while the statistical programmer would be uh, responsible for the data quality and things like that. And I think, um, I don't know how it works in academia, but it's, when we're talking about patient groups and collecting data, it's almost like data is coming in and next step is research or treatments or, but this, this data, this data piece is missing. So I think, uh, I think as I'm trying to kind of encourage all the rare disease groups to make sure they have a data advisor, I'm also, I also want to work with our industry to make sure that we have we have people that know about this and, you know, build this bridge and make sure that uh, we have these resources that are available and can help. That that makes sense. Uh, and if if you look at uh, be, be, maybe besides having a, a data advisor and building your uh, data uh, dictionary uh, and starting data analysis uh, at the point where you're, uh, you have your first uh, patient data collected, uh, which other tips would you usually give some of these advocacy groups? So I, I, I so survey is very important. I think a, a lot of times there is a belief that the more data, the better it is, but that's not necessarily true. Sometimes it's better to have less data and have a purpose for everything that we are collecting. It makes it easier to create a high quality data set uh, that makes sense rather than um, have a, you know, collect a lot of information where we might end up with a lot of missing information. I mean, that's uh, very important. Um, I definitely recommend considering how they're going to work with the data and how they're going to analyze it. So uh, a lot of the groups are just using Excel. If they're only using Excel, they have to make sure that the format that the data comes in, that it can be re you know easily summarized in Excel, but still Excel is pretty limited. Uh, so it has to be a really well-structured data where you can really get some insights out of the data in Excel. Um, you know, in SAS, we have a lot more flexibility, but in Excel, we don't have as much. Um, I I really encourage patient groups to be transparent and to disclose why the registry was created. When I say why, I don't mean like to find a cure. Uh, because sometimes I hear like, okay, this registry is here to find a cure. Uh, to You know, the purpose of the registry is it to create natural history data? Is it to contact patients for clinical trials? There could be a lot of uh, different reasons the registry is created to share the purpose of the registry, to let patients know what information is being collected, how the surveys are developed, uh, how the data is used by your foundation, um, medical records. Uh, if Sometimes patients are asked to upload medical records, but it's unclear why or it's unclear if anything happens with those records because you know if patients are just uploading pdf files with their medical records and nobody is working on those pdf files to convert them into data sets they may just be you know sitting within that platform and it may just not be as useful so i always say you know if you're asking for medical records then then you need to know why and and let the patients know why they're being asked um you know share how the data is accessed, who makes these decisions on data access, um, 
definitely share when results will be shared. And I also tell patients, you know, ask, um, ask all those questions to the, you know, when you are enrolling, find out when the results will be shared with you, find out how the data is used by the foundations. These are all very important and creates transparency and it creates accountability, which is like really, really needed. Perhaps you could um, share with us uh, any insights on any publications uh, that you may have been part of uh, helping bring to life as a result of the, your focused work on improving this problem with data at, at the register. So actually, um, it's interesting, but when I first um, became involved with this, I have worked on a patient registry that had over 1,000 patients, and I published a paper on that registry. The the really incredible thing about that data, uh, there was a question asking, what is the most important thing, thing for uh, that patients want doctors, researchers, uh, industry partners to know? And um, these, 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 these were free text answers that were incredibly insightful. And so I was able to give voice to these patients and bring, these, um, bring their responses to life. And um, so that was incredibly meaningful and patients have written very, very personal responses. And some patients wrote things such as, uh, you know, can you please call me back? Can you please get back to me? So it was just, um, you could tell, you know, how much trust and hope they put into this. Um, and so that was very, very meaningful for me. And I also highlighted some of the things that needed to be improved in the registry. But I have to say that at that time, when I got into this field, I was incredibly naive. And I, I think I was thinking that, you know, okay, now working with this data, we can see how much these patients want to be heard. And we found all these um, uh, data issues that can be improved. And so uh, this is incredible. Now we're going to, you know, we're going to publish this paper and we're going to bring all these doctors and all these people together and we will talk about it and we'll make this all better. And, you know, we'll improve this communication with between doctors and patients and we'll create these better registries. And so I definitely was uh, looking back, I was very much naive because it's not as easy as I thought. And it did not happen at all the way I thought it was gonna happen. So I'll just say that I still have the same goals. I still wanna make sure that patients are heard and I still wanna make sure that we have better registries, but now I'm going about it in a much longer way um, right now, I'm working with Cure Mita Foundation, where I'm on the board, and Cure Mita Foundation focus is um, the syndrome, which is the disease that my daughter died from. We have a patient registry that I've created with this foundation. It's a worldwide registry for Lee syndrome, and um, so I just wanted to share to share that and. Uh, with this registry, I'm kind of tr I'm trying to sort of bring everything I'm talking about to life. So we we are trying to be accountable to the patient. It's very transparent. Every time I share about the registry, I say that you know we have an open door policy. If you have a question, if you have a concern, there's no question that's off the table. Every voice is heard, and we are sharing our results transparently. We have multiple authors in all our publications, so it's a real collaboration. Um, people are welcome to join our efforts. It's a worldwide registry and we always say, you know, if you would like to contribute and work together, you're welcome. And um, and so we are trying to bring these things to life. And actually, um, one other thing I wanted to, to also share about that registry is that we worked with um, a company, Sumptuous Data Sciences, and we were able to convert our data to CDISC. Uh, so with this registry, uh, I'm really, really trying to bring all these things to life. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's not an easy, you know, it, initially I was definitely very naive going to the rare disease patient advocacy space. Yeah. And, and you sound so passionate about this topic, uh, Sophia, obviously for, for, for clear reasons that you've already articulated. Um, have you encountered any headwinds when you've been trying to fly the flag for data at the registry and any pushback from people within the organizations who maybe don't think that this should be such a focus? Um, I would say yes. 
I will say okay. yes. I don't, I'm not going to name specific people or organizations, but I will yeah. say that it's not easy because this has been, this is how this is going on. This is this this is how it's been set for a long, long time. And so when you bring in these questions and like and saying, you know, maybe this data, you know, maybe you have to do this differently, you know, not not everybody likes it, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, you know, we, I have to. We have to work hard because it's very important. It's it's about the patients, and in rare disease, kids are dying. You know, very young within a few years and if we give them this hope we have to we have to do better for them we have to do better and uh it's very doable do getting a better data is not as hard as finding a cure it's very doable it's what we know how to do it's really just a matter of talking and having open dialogue about what's important and saying okay we are going to do this uh, uh, we're going to do this together. It's not, you know, it's not something that hasn't been discovered. Yet. This is all discovered. We know how to get more data. So we have to, we have to do this. Yeah. I think an underlying theme that uh, Ivana and I pick up on when it comes to uh, people trying to, um, well, people talking about topics and transformation in trials is, is change, change management. It's, that's often the most tricky part of introducing any new idea be it a concept technology or process into any organization so it sounds like you may have encountered some of that too um something i wanted to touch or we wanted to touch upon was um we know you're doing some work with uh, organizations like fuse um perhaps you could um we've got a broad uh, church in terms of our listeners so some people don't even know, won't even know who fuse are uh, but maybe you could elaborate a bit on uh, a little bit about what who fuse are and then the work that you're doing with fuse and why that's important yeah so fuse is a sort of a data science community where many industry professionals are participating they have conferences they have many working groups on different topics and um so uh, because for so long, I wanted to find a way to kind of bridge the gap between to improve the, uh, you know, the patient registered data and bridge the gap with the industry. I have started um, a working group with Fuse that is specifically focused on, on bridging that gap. Um, and it's, it's, it's so important because a lot of my colleagues in the industry, they've never talked to anyone in the patient community who is working on these registries or who is a patient advocate. And I myself didn't either until I, until I had my, my own personal experience, I have never interacted with anyone from the patient community. So, so they really don't know what's going on and what the challenges are. And in the meantime, all these rare disease groups, they are creating these registries, which they want to have, um, which they want to use to help uh, clinical trials and to be used by the industry, but they've never heard from the industry and they don't know what's important. So uh, this gap, this gap just has to be bridged. So that's why I, I started this this working uh, with this working group, and um, it's going well. Uh, we are working on some materials that will emphasize sort of again like data quality things like that. We're going to create some checklists. At our as a first thing, we're not going to write a paper because we want something that will be, you know. Easy to easy uh, to understand and read. So we are creating some sort of infographics, things like that, and we 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 will have some first things available pretty soon. Um, so that's very interesting. And we've had um, someone from the patient community who came as a guest speaker to our group and told uh, you know their story and how they're working with the registry data, and it was very interesting to everyone in the group. So it's really working to create these connections. And we're going to have these materials, uh, and it will create more of a two-way communi uh, two-way communication between industry and patients. And I'm just so happy that uh, we're doing this. And there's still a lot to do, but at least it, the process is, you know, there, and we're bringing these challenges and these issues out there, and we're working on it. And it's so amazing that there is this gap because uh, both parties are so interested in getting in touch with each other. From Life Sciences, uh, we speak about trying to understand the patients all the time, and yet they are, and we we actually don't talk to them. And these patients groups are trying to create data that we can benefit from. Uh, and 
yet we we don't even know that it's out there. It's a it's such a waste uh, on both parts. I know, isn't it? It's it's incredible. And so yeah. Yeah. So I'm in a unique position where I can connect the dots because I'm in both places, because I'm yeah. in a patient advocacy and in the industry, which is interesting because most people are either in one or the other. So I'm trying to use this, um, you know, my unique position to, you know, to, to build these bridges and uh, address these gaps. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's amazing. Sophia, I, I'm curious, uh, if you are a patient uh, considering donating your data to a patient uh, advocacy group, to a patient registry, is there any way that you can know whether uh, it's an organization that will take good care of your data and put it to good use, or if uh, it's just going to gather dust in some database somewhere? Yeah. So I always tell the patients, please ask questions. Don't, don't worry, ask questions. It's your data. You are ta- you're taking your time. Many of these patients are a caregiver to a child who is very sick. They don't have any free time or they are themselves very sick. You are giving your time. You are, you are uh, completing information. You are, you are uh, contributing your own data. You have a right to ask these questions. Uh, don't feel bad about asking questions. Ask why the registry is there. Ask what information is collected. Ask how your data will be used. If you are asked to upload medical records, ask why. What will be done with this record? Why are they? Why do you have to upload them? Ask um, how the data is shared and who is making these decisions. Ask when you will see the results. Ask all these information and also ask that it's shared transparently on the organization's website. So that uh, I mean, ideally, it should be it should be there easy to find. But um, you know, please ask questions. Uh, find out if there have been any publications based on the data, prior publications, because that will tell you if something is going on with this data or not. Um, it's so important. Uh, I mean, it's hard for the patients because they have so much on their plates. But um, you know, it's it. I'm trying to empower the patients. I want them to be more empowered. And yeah, just ask, definitely ask questions. Don't worry about asking questions. And 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 if you get a response, if you don't get the response or something like that, I mean, that is very unfortunate, but that also tells you uh, something. I think that's such an important point because I think often as a member of the public or a patient, you just go in assuming people are experts in everything particularly when you're uh, transferring your care into their ownership. And if you don't ask the right questions, you often don't get the responses that you need. Um, So, yeah, very loud and clear, ask the right questions. Um, The patient advocacy groups who are trying to collect the data for the registries, what would be your main take-home message for them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would say, you know, uh, so even when we work on a clinical trial and we are we are creating all our questionnaires and case report forms we you know keeping the uh, specifically for the clinical trial and we have a very professional large team working on the data we end up with so so many um potential data issues that we are resolving uh now for the patient groups i don't think that it should be on them to get data to the same standard, because that's impossible. Um, it's impossible for them, and it's just too much to put on them. They shouldn't have to be required to create the data to that standard. But they can absolutely get data to a quality where it's acceptable and where it may their data makes sense. So I just want to give one example. Our foundation, Cure Mida Foundation, we have once spoke to a researcher who is very well known in our field and he's you know, world renowned. And we told him that we have a registry and he said, well, uh, let me see what you have. I wanna understand what you have. And so he's a very, very busy person. It's almost impossible to meet with him, but he met with us for one hour and I showed him the summary of all our data and how it looks. And he said, okay, well, now it makes sense to me. He said, I wanted to see you know, the patient's age the patient's diagnosis, um, he, the, the data makes sense within the context of this disease. He says, now that I've seen it, I can understand that your registry can be used because just because there is a registry doesn't mean that it, 
at a minimum, we cannot get our data to a regulatory grade, but we can get our data where at least it makes sense within the context of the disease. So the age, the diagnosis, the main symptoms, that should reflect the disease we are collecting the data for. And that patient groups can absolutely do that. Well, Sophia, as we uh, come to a close of our conversation, we always ask our guests one uh, final question that's always the same. Uh, and if we were to give you a magic wand and you could make a uh, one wish that would change our industry, what would you wish for? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I think that uh, right now, especially in rare disease and even everywhere else, the patients are so proactive. Uh, I think we need to. We, I think we need to do more to connect with them because they're so proactive and they're doing so much, and we just need we just need more of that of that connection and communication. Uh, but I also have to say that as I've been working through my way in you know rare disease patient advocacy, I actually came to appreciate a lot of things about our industry. Uh, something that I didn't notice before, like things that you know we are our success is assessed based on the based on our results we are accountable for our work. And I think that's really good. And I love, uh, I actually love, and nobody's ever perfect, you know, no, not everyone's perfect and there's no system that's perfect, but I, but I think there's so much good in the industry that I'm actually trying to bring that good, the accountability into these other areas I'm in. I really love that you're building that bridge uh, uh, being, uh, yeah, just yourself, basically, just connecting two so desperate areas. Uh, that's that's really amazing. Thank you, thank you. And I'm sure that our listeners will be uh, really interested in that too. And there may even be some patient advocacy groups listening, or maybe some uh, companies in rare diseases interesting interested in some of this data uh, that they may not have known about. So, Sophia, how can people reach out to you if they want to continue the conversation? Yeah, um, I'm available on LinkedIn and you want to look me up and I'm always happy to connect. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody. And my email is sophiazilber at gmail.com and please email me. Um, happy, Very happy to hear from, from your listeners. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Sophia. This was an incredible episode. Thank you. Thank you. Listening to Transformation in Trials. If you have a suggestion for a guest for our show, reach out to Sam Parnell or Ivana Rosendale on LinkedIn. You can find more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or in any other player. Remember to subscribe and get the episodes hot off the editor.